Bournemouth, on England's south coast, magnet for tourists and one of the wealthiest towns in the country. But in 2000, a threatening cloud appeared over this summer playground, putting its residents and visitors in deadly peril. It began with a bizarre phone call to the director of security for Tesco, Britain's biggest supermarket chain. We received a phone call from um, a newsagent in Bournemouth. Someone had used a photocopier and had left the original and thought we might be interested in it. We were most certainly interested in it because it was basically a demand on the Tesco stores. The letter left on the newsagent's photocopier contained a chilling threat. It demanded money from Tesco and warned of deadly consequences if the company failed to comply. The letter made demands with the threats that if uh, Tesco's didn't provide that money, then uh, Tesco's customers would be hurt by bombs being sent through the post to them. The letter contained few clues about the author's identity. It was signed Sally and was headed without prejudice. But unusually, that was uh, spelt incorrectly. The extortionists signed themselves off with a woman's name. But was this a woman? Mm, I think quite a few of us had our reservations that it was a woman, but again, we kept an open mind. But despite the mystery of who Sally really was, the letter made clear how Tesco were to deliver the money. He required that Tesco's produce club cards that would be placed in all of the Daily Echo's uh, newspapers on a particular day, and that each of those club cards would have been set up uh, and capable of being used in ATM machines. The Daily Echo was Dorset's biggest local newspaper, with a circulation of more than 50,000 copies. If each paper contained a modified Tesco club card that could be used to withdraw cash, the extortioner was in line for a mammoth payout. Sally had provided a PIN number that only he would know. What he required was to be able to withdraw £1,000 per club card. If all the club cards were set up to withdraw £1,000, effectively, Tesco's could lose £50 million in a day. Tesco realised that even if Sally was unable to collect all the cards himself, they still faced the prospect of enormous losses. Let's say that we'd complied with the demand, given him or her a code, and then this individual goes on local radio and says, by the way, if you, if you use one of those cards that was in the Bournemouth Echo today, and this is the PIN number, you'll get a thousand pound. We could have had people going to every ATM in the Bournemouth area using these cards. I mean, it's a huge uh, risk. One of the first puzzles for the police was why the extortioner had singled out Tesco. By the summer of 2000, the company was attracting widespread publicity for its booming profits and aggressive expansion. But as officers working on the case soon discovered, it was making enemies as well as headlines. Tesco's is a massive multinational company. They'd had a number of uh, complaints made against them. There were a number of uh, civil uh, litigation type cases against them. And clearly there were a wide range of people that might have a grievance against Tesco's and cause them to try and commit this type of offence. There have been a number of um, past employees that had been dismissed for misconduct or had left the company with a little bit of a grudge. So but they certainly had to be considered as possible suspects. Perhaps more worrying was the theory that Sally was not working alone, but was part of an organised gang. You would imagine that Sally was an individual man that wanted to make money for himself. But you had to bear in mind that effectively this could be a large criminal organisation, it could be some type of anarchist group, and they could be working in unison. There was always a possibility of that. I mean, is this an activist group that are trying to get back at us or use us to promote their cause? 
On August the 30th, detectives got their first potential breakthrough. Tesco received a second threatening letter, identical to the first, except that it was fire damaged. Had the author had second thoughts after sending it? Sally may have been concerned that that original letter had been left on the photocopier. Perhaps he felt that he'd been seen. One of the considerations was that he or she had tried to destroy the letter that they'd posted. But in attempting to burn the evidence, the extortioner had given the police a possible lead. It was really important to me that I located where that fire had occurred, and I presumed it was likely to be in a post box somewhere in Bournemouth. So we made inquiries uh, and found out that, in fact, there had been a fire in a post box at a place called Bradpole Road in Bournemouth. As police went to examine the burned-out post box, their spirits were high. They now not only had a possible source of forensic clues, it also seemed that Sally had given up his extortion campaign as quickly as he'd started it. But their mood soon changed. Tesco received a third letter, one which upped the stakes. It said small bombs were ready to be sent to its customers' homes. And if demands weren't met, the bombs would get bigger. When Tesco's received the letter at their Ferndown store, quite clearly this was a serious extortion demand. We were very keen to know what we were dealing with here. Did we have um, a, an individual who was determined to uh, cause serious harm to Tesco's customers? What was this individual's motivation? Extremely concerning times for us uh, and some questions that we needed to get some answers to. But as Tesco examined the latest letter in detail, they discovered a serious flaw in Sally's plans. A thousand pounds was what he wanted for any single transaction. It's not possible to get a thousand pounds worth of notes through the ATM aperture. It won't work. The police didn't want Sally to feel they were ignoring his threats. They felt they had no choice but to contact him and explain the problem with his ATM plan. They would communicate via the Bournemouth Echo, just as the letters demanded. We used an undercover police officer to place an advert in the local paper, asking Sally to contact us by way of a phone number, hoping that we could trick him into responding. The first secret message ran in the Echo on the 6th of September. Meanwhile, Bournemouth Police Station became the base for the biggest, most secretive investigation Dorset Police had ever known, Operation Hornbill. There were about 100 officers that were working on the inquiry. We were working 24 hours a day. Officers were selected from across the, the, the whole force area and put onto this specific investigation. Our colleagues didn't actually know what we were investigating and we weren't allowed to tell them. There was good reason for this secrecy. In 1990, a blackmailer named Rodney Wichelow was jailed for trying to extort millions of pounds from the food company Heinz. He'd carried out his threat to spike jars of supermarket baby food with broken glass and caustic soda. When police finally tracked him down, they found to their horror that he was a Metropolitan Police detective. Might the same be true of Sally? There was always the concern that maybe Sally was a police officer. Some of the terminology used by Sally, he would say, I've deployed a bomb, and the term without prejudice, which he always used, gave the impression that maybe this was legal, it was police jargon, and we were again dealing with a police officer. But whoever Sally was, he'd suddenly gone quiet. It failed to contact the police on the number they'd supplied in the Bournemouth Echo. And after another two weeks without communication, DSI Phil James called a meeting with colleagues from across the UK.
I was with uh, senior officers from New Scotland Yard and from the National Kidnap and Extortion Unit. We were actually sitting there discussing the risk that uh, Sally posed. He's not actually carried out any life-threatening menace. He's not actually sent any devices, and it's very difficult to assess the risk. There was a knock at the door. And I was told by one of my officers that, in fact, an incendiary device, a firebomb, had just gone off. The atmosphere of the meeting suddenly changed. Clearly, there was a risk, and the threat was very, very real. Three weeks after the Tesco bomber had written his first extortion demand, he carried out his threat. A device had exploded in a Bournemouth suburb and police across the county were scrambled to the scene. There had been an explosion at an address in Ferndown. The female occupant had opened a letter which had exploded in her face. The victim was taken to hospital with minor injuries. Police called in the bomb squad. It was quite easy to see that what, what we had was the remains of um, a very small amount of incendiary composition. It had been functioning inside um, a CD cassette case, and that in, in turn had been inside a jiffy bag of about A5, A4 size. From a technical point of view, this is not um, a lethal device, but it could have set fire to property and obviously endangering the public. As the squad examined the device, it became clear that Sally was a resourceful bomb maker. The device had been functioned by a party popper. This had been cut down and inserted into the cassette case. A safety pin that was attached to the jiffy bag had possibly been used as the anchor to then pull the party popper as the cassette was um, removed from the jiffy bag. Once the device was declared safe, police warned the Royal Mail to be on the lookout for suspicious packages. Within hours, they received an emergency call from a nearby sorting office. By the time we arrived, the police had done a good job of evacuating the immediate area, uh, and obviously this was a fairly, uh, you know, major incident. The first priority really was to ascertain that we were dealing with the same level of threat that we didn't, you know, have devices that um, were significantly more dangerous. Well aware of the bomber's recent threat to deploy bigger devices, the bomb squad used a portable X-ray machine to scan the three packages. Having taken the X-rays and then realised that we, we were dealing with the same type of device, we came up with a plan. To preserve as much evidence as possible, the squad would defuse the letter bombs by hand. This wasn't a device that had actually, you know, to my knowledge, been seen before, but it followed common principles. We had to separate the party popper string from the safety clip, and then taking apart the case and, and removing the amount of um, explosive that was there. But as the squad continued their task, the bomber expanded his operation. Seven more menacing letters were sent to Tesco customers' homes. These were letters that identified that they'd been uh, followed home, that uh, Sally knew that they were uh, Tesco's customers and that they may be subject to further uh, threats or bombs through the post. I realised that things become a lot more serious and that uh, the extortionists were saying to us, you know, I've told you I can do this, I've done it, now give me the money. It was quite a shock, really, to, to think that 